This is the third installment of the Meadow Snows webinar series. Uh, in today's session, we're here to discuss solutions for seeding and planting operations in row crops. My name is Derek Brazda, the host of the United We Ag podcast and Midwest Key Accounts Manager for Meadows USA. And as always, I'll be your host this morning. Um, as we get ready for planting season throughout you know, the United States and Canada uh, in our row crop operations, we thought it'd be a good idea to put together a program that focuses on early season so, uh, fertility and soil preparation. Um, we've got some great presentations and actually live demonstrations for you today that go in depth explaining both the agronomics behind plant nutrition as well as how to use IoT solutions for a, uh, in, uh, for a positive ROI on your farming operations. Before we kick things off, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, so for anybody that's been on one of our webinars in the past, you can see that we've switched up platforms from the first two installments of the webinar, moving from Google over here to Zoom. So after a few practice runs, we think we've got all the, all the, uh, uh, the kinks worked out, but please bear with us in the event of any technical hiccups. We're not anticipating any. Uh, and now if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button that says Q&A. Uh, as always, if you have any questions at any point throughout the webinar or throughout the demonstration, uh, click that button, type it in your question, and we'll do our best to answer everything at the end of the presentation. So having said that, I think we'll just jump right into things. Uh, first guest today uh, joining us is Tyler Steinkamp, technical agronomist from Winfield United out of Iowa. Tyler's been an agronomist for Winfield for the past nine years, holds a degree in agronomy from South Dakota State, as well as his master's of agronomy from Iowa State. His day-to-day -day responsibilities uh, uh, entails him training Winfield employees, affiliates, and growers around chemicals and fertility issues throughout the growing season. Today, Tyler joins us to discuss fertility uh, in specific as we prepare for the 2021 planting season. Uh, additionally, anybody who's ever been on one of our webinars in the past knows Guy Ash, Global Training Leader for Pestle Instruments and GM of Meadows Canada. Uh, Guy is a seasoned agrometeorologist who's worked all over Canada on crop modeling as it pertains to weather, as well as all over the world to train pestle employees and growers on how to effectively use Meadows IoT solutions to provide a positive ROI in farm applications. Today, Guy is going to talk specifically about that, uh, showing us what solutions you need to be prepared for planting season, as well as the value you can receive from having a set of actionable environmental monitoring tools on your farm. Tyler, Guy, thank you so much for being here. How are things going today? Great. We're uh, warming up pretty quick here in Iowa, and it looks like uh, we'll be starting to do some planting uh, next week, I would think. Oh man, that's, it seems too soon, but I, I don't feel like we're, we're that far off. If it hadn't been so windy uh, here across the Midwest, I think there'd be a lot more, a lot more fertilizer going down. Um, guys are starting to, to go a little bit. I think we may have had a little bit more rain in Eastern Nebraska than you've had, uh, but it's definitely progressing. <laughs> You're better yeah. off than we are both of you. We're, we're yeah. snowing minus 20 this morning. A little cold uh, up there, can... guy. Yeah. <laughs> You can eat mm, hot cup of coffee this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, uh, I have to say I'm excited because this is the first time, this is the first webinar we've done where we have actual live demonstrations to show. So um, Tyler, I'm going to go ahead and give you the floor yeah. and let you go ahead and dive right into it. So sounds great. So I wanted to spend some time talking about soil fertility. And in particular, I, I made this demonstration. It, it's nothing that you guys probably haven't seen before. Um, a lot of you guys have probably heard of the stave and barrel approach to plant nutrition. In other words, if you think of a wine barrel or a whiskey barrel, whichever you prefer, whichever type of barrel you have there, the lowest stave on that barrel is what's going to be limiting the amount of wine or whatever uh, type of liquid you have that that barrel can actually hold, right? Okay, well, the same is true of plant nutrition. Now, I tried to make a barrel, but my uh, carpentry skills aren't that great. So we have a box here this time. And it really does a nice job of explaining plant nutrition. Okay, and we're, we're going to go through and talk about some of these individual nutrients as we go. But I wanted to go through and talk about how are all these different nutrients interact with one another. The most limiting nutrient in your system is what is going to limit your overall yield potential. Okay, so as I start to try to add more yield, as I try to add more yield, you can see that I'm limited in this case in zinc. Okay, and so I'm, I'm losing yield mainly because I 
do not have enough of that particular nutrient. Now, some farmers make the mistake of say, oh, well, it's all about nitrogen. It's all about potassium. It's all about all these other nutrients, right? It's about the most limiting nutrient in that system. Okay, so I could apply more nitrogen, for example, into the system, and I'm, I'm probably not going to see a yield increase because at this point, zinc is my most limiting factor. Okay, so maybe I go and make an application of zinc. Now, as was mentioned earlier, I, I do a lot with both crop nutrition and crop protection. And, and actually, I prefer the crop protection side a little bit more because with crop protection, for example, with weed control, I can usually tell whether a weed is going to die out in the field or not, right? By spraying it, I'm, I'm pretty confident that that particular weed is going to die. I've had a couple of water hemp surprise me over the years, but uh, for the most part, I can tell whether that weed is going to die or not. The frustrating part about soil fertility is, as you can see here, I fixed my zinc problem. Okay, but as I try to add more yield here, now I have a phosphorus problem. Okay, and, and so understand that with crop nutrition, just because I add one nutrient doesn't mean that another nutrient might not also be limiting. And so it's about building the system. It's about uh, increasing your plant nutrition over time to try to cover as many of these gaps as we possibly can. Okay, so we're, we're building that yield over time and each one of these nutrients has to be managed differently. One thing you'll notice is that on this, and I, I, I don't know how good the video is coming through, but you should be able to somewhat notice that each one of these nutrients is a different color. What that stands for, it's, it's not because it's a Christmas colors here, although I did use green and red. Okay, we, we got red is for those nutrients that are in the soil that are not, they're, they're non-mobile, okay? Because when you look at a soil, a majority of our soils are negatively charged. Okay, so if we have positively charged ions like potassium, like um, things like zinc, they actually connect onto our soil. Whereas things like nitrogen, as it converts over to nitrate, will actually leach through that soil profile. So that's what the different colors mean. But our goal is to continue to build this yield and to try to, over time, improve our overall soil fertility. With a lot of these guys, it, it's not something that we can do necessarily in one or two years. It's going to take some time to build those fertility levels. But as we continue to build, we're able to get more and more yield potential out of that. Okay, And so over time, you're slowly trying to elevate as many of these nutrients as you possibly can so that we don't have that limiting uh, nutrition, okay? Now, one thing to consider, here I fix as many of those nutrients as I can here, right? Okay, and I'm, I'm able to get a much higher yield with this, but you can't just look at nutrition in a vacuum, okay? And, and I, I feel like a lot of farmers do make them this mistake. Some of them are very good. They're focused on weed control. They kill all their weeds, no problem but they forget about the fertility side. Some of them focus all on the weed control or on the uh, nutrition, but they forget the weed control or maybe the disease uh, control out in the field. Okay, so if we don't manage all of this, remember it's all a system. So if we forget about the diseases, if we forget about something uh, as simple as just making sure we get weeds controlled on time, we can easily, lose all of these, all of the progress that we made right out the back here, and we lost all of that yield potential. Okay, so we have to do a good job of managing the entire system, and I'm sure uh, Guy's going to talk more about uh, making sure we get planted correctly and making sure all these conditions are right, um, and all of this goes into play when we start talking about plant nutrition as a whole. Okay, so I'm going to switch and we're going to go uh, back to the screen here. Okay, so when we're talking about early season plant fertility and, and plant fertility in general, there's three main ways that plant nutrients are taken up in the plant and moving in the soil. Okay, the first way is through diffusion. 
with diffusion, basically the nutrient is moving from an area of a high concentration to an area of a low concentration. Okay, so if you think about a, a plant root, generally the plant root will pull nutrients out of the water and you'll move from a high concentration of, let's say, potassium to a low concentration near the root. We take up that, that potassium in that case. The next is through mass flow. Okay, so if you think of mass flow, mass flow is basically when the nutrients move with water. Okay, so a lot of our negatively charged nutrients do tend to move this way. So think of like nitrate, nitrogen, think of things like sulfur, boron. They move in the soil fairly readily with the soil water. It's actually a fairly efficient way to get those particular nutrients into the plant because you have, um, it's pretty passive system. It just moves into the plant with the water that the plant's already taken up. The last one is root intercept. There's not a lot of nutrients that are taken up um, exclusively or, or very, uh, very much through root intercept, but basically this is just where the root happens to run right into the nutrient as it's growing. The only one that's fairly significant in this is zinc. Okay? And, and here just is a breakdown of all these various types of nutrients and how they move. Okay, with root intercept, not a lot. Zinc, though, is the one exception. We got about 30% of our zinc uptake is just taken up through the movement of that, um, of that root through the soil. Mass flow, think of all the negatively charged ions in the soil, so things like nitrogen. Actually, 98% of the nitrogen that's in the soil will be taken up in the nitrate form or in the negatively charged form through mass flow. Okay, phosphorus, not a lot, potassium, not a lot. Sulfur, 95% of sulfur will be taken up in the sulfate form through mass flow. Boron, about 65%. Diffusion, on the other hand, we have 91% taken up through phosphorus, almost nothing basically taken up with nitrogen. Um, potassium, about 78%. Uh, and then zinc, about 40% there. Okay, so let's go into a little more detail on each one of these. So we're going to talk about diffusion. Okay, diffusion is the process by which we're going from a high concentration over to a low concentration. Okay, so to give you an example, I'm going to bring this up a little bit. Hold on. I make a little bit of a mess when I do this demonstration. My wife doesn't care for it. <laughs> I was going to ask, is, that, is all that corn just falling on the ground? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, and it's uh, you know that uh, that effect you get when you step on a Lego. Oh yeah, it's not too much unlike that. I should have worn shoes. I, I realize now. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, we're we're all just too used to Zoom calls and webinars now, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, so process of diffusion. I'll I'll explain how this works, and it's best if I can just show you. So I'm going to stop sharing here, and you should be able to see my screen or my uh, camera again. Okay. Yep. So what we have here, just a regular jar of water, okay? And then I have a little bit of red food coloring. So if you think of this food coloring, it's water and a dye, right? And so, but the key is this dye is at a much higher concentration than it is in this water, right? There's, there's nothing in this water right now, right? So if I put this dye here on top, what's going to happen? Well, it moves, right? It moves throughout that entire jar until it's completely equalized throughout the entire jar. That is the process of diffusion. I'm moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. And nutrients do the same thing in, in water. You think of, or uh, in uh, soils, you think of things like potassium, like phosphorus. They move almost exclusively through diffusion. It's a slower process, but it does get the job done, okay? And as the plant pulls that nutrient out of the soil water, what ends up happening is there's a higher concentration on the soil particles, and eventually through diffusion, that'll move away uh, from the soil particle and head towards the root for more uptake. 
Okay, so the key with diffusion is the more nutrient that I can have in the soil, the more and the faster that this process is going to take place. Okay, so let's take a look at a few nutrients that move almost exclusively through diffusion, starting with potassium. So potassium, you can see some of the deficiencies that we have. Um, it's actually really visual on corn and alfalfa. Alfalfa, it, right there up at the top, you can see it's kind of a unique um, nutrient deficiency where you get these little speckling. And some people uh, confuse it with uh, something like uh, leafhopper burn, but usually it starts at the bottom part of the plant and moves its way up. Potassium is mobile in the plant, so you're going to see that you're going to see that deficiency start in the bottom of the plant and move its way up. Same with the corn. Corn's going to burn on the outside of the edge of the leaves and move up. Wheat will do the same thing, as will uh, soybeans there. So potassium uptake, and, and this is specifically around corn. When you look at potassium, a majority of the potassium is taking up during the grand growth stage on corn. And in fact, if you look at how much potassium we need to grow, um, in, in Iowa here, we, we strive for 300 bushel corn. So 300 bushel corn. Um, 300 bushel corn per acre takes up roughly about 15.3 um, pounds of potassium per day per acre. And I know that there's a wide variety of audience here. Um, I, I don't know the metric terminology for that, and I apologize, but uh, it's a lot. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get Guy on the translation. Don't worry. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. 15.3 <laughs> pounds of potassium per acre per day during this grand growth period. So a significant amount of potassium needs to be taken up during that time. Okay, so the key with this is we gotta get more potassium in the soil. Because remember back to our diffusion, um, diffusion example there, the higher concentration that I can get, the quicker this process takes place. Okay, so if you look at some of the recommendations for Iowa, Usually if I'm going after high yield corn, I'm gonna to wanna to be in that 200 to 240 parts per million range for high yield corn um, in Iowa here, okay? And if I really wanna go shoot for the moon, I'm gonna go for 240 plus, okay? Now, the hard part is it does take a fair amount of potassium to raise your soil test. So it takes about six to 10 pounds of actual potassium to raise your soil test value one part per million. If you're applying potash, it'd be about 10 to 17 pounds of potash, okay, to raise your soil test one part per million. And that is at and above the removal rate of what you're removing with the crop, okay? So we do uh, need a fair amount of potassium to write some of these prescriptions to increase our soil test value. Phosphorus is taken up in the same way. The more phosphorus that I can have in that soil, the more overall availability I'm going to have later in the season. This is a great example. This is uh, actually using starter fertilizer. One of the things that we found was in lower testing phosphorus soils, oftentimes early in the spring, we cannot get enough phosphorus available to that crop. So what you'll notice is in our untreated check, these are both the same hybrid right next to each other. On our untreated check, we had nothing in furrow, no phosphorus. And this, this particular plot is a little bit low in phosphorus. Um, versus on the right, we had 1034 So we had 34 or uh, four gallons of um, phosphorus-based fertilizer in furrow. And you can see we eliminated that phosphorus deficiency uh, by having that in furrow. Okay, now phosphorus is a little different than nitrogen and potassium. Nitrogen and potassium are taken up very readily through that grain growth stage on corn. And actually in, in soybeans, some of these other ones, they're, they're taken up um, fairly readily right when that plant is flowering generally. Okay, but you can see with phosphorus, it's even throughout the entire uh, growing period here. Okay, and if we wanna get more phosphorus availability, we need to first of all have more in the soil. We also need to make sure we're paying attention to our soil pH as well, because one of the things uh, phosphorus can have problems with if, if we do not have the right pH, you will not get enough phosphorus available. Okay, when you're looking at 
availability and, and depending on where you're at will determine uh, what test you're probably taking. But this is my general recommendations. If you're going shooting for the moon uh, for yield, I wanna be in this very high category. Otherwise, if you're just growing high yield corn, soybeans, alfalfa, wheat, um, I'm gonna to wanna to be in that high category, okay? Here just gives a quick uh, breakdown of where each one of these different tests would be expected. And we can follow up if you guys have further questions on this one. Um, just feel free to reach out to Derek or somebody and, and I can uh, answer any of those. But uh, we, won't, we won't quite have time to go through all of that today. Okay, but to raise your soil test value one part per million for phosphorus, you need 16 to 20 pounds of P2O5. That'd be about 35 to 39 pounds of DAP at and above the removal rate. Okay, so with products and nutrients that move through diffusion, the key is to increase your soil test value. With products that move through mass flow, like nitrogen, like sulfur, those type of products, the key is we have to get it as close to when that plant actually needs the nutrient as we can. So for example, for corn, 75% of the nitrogen is taken up before tassel, and almost 80% of that is taken up during this grand growth stage in corn. So we want to get um, as much available during that time as possible. Now, we can't have all of it at that time because actually from V5 to V6, we're already determining the rows around on corn. And so if we don't have enough nitrogen available at the beginning of the season, we can actually see a reduction in yield. So I want to have at least 50 to 60% of my nitrogen on up front and then come back in in season and do um, an application around V4 to V5 to get ahead of this grand growth stage. Because when we're going for about 300 bushel corn here, you can see we need about 11 pounds of nitrogen per day per acre. Now the hard part, I'm gonna shift this camera. Sorry, they didn't, uh, they didn't give me an assistant yet. <laughs> All right. Now, the hard part about nitrogen and sulfur and those type of things is they do tend to move in the soil, okay? Now, we just got done talking about um, nutrients that move through mass flow. What I have here, this is a, a sand, okay? Now, this sand um, obviously does not have a very negative charge. And, and negative charges we measure in what's called CEC, the cation exchange capacity, okay, of the soil. Most of our soils will have a negative charge. Even the sand has a negative charge, okay? And when I add this dye, uh, this is water mixed with a positively charged dye here. When I add that into the system, onto the soil here, what you'll notice is that blue dye is all getting caught up in that top couple inches of soil. And we got clear water that comes out through the base here. The tough part with nutrients that move through mass flow, things like nitrogen, sulfur, boron, those type of uh, products and nutrients, they're negatively charged. So this orange dye is actually a negatively charged dye. When I add those into the soil, they actually move through the soil. Okay, and, and the part of the hard part about that, although they are very available and they're very easy for the plants to take up, if these do um, they'll move with rainwater. And so if these do get down below the tile line and below the uh, root zone, I'm not going to get that taken up. It's going to end up going out the tile. And then we got some environmental concerns there. Okay. Here's just a mix of the two, just to show you the blue and the orange coming apart here. The orange are going to go right through that soil, whereas the negative or the positively charged nutrient is going to 
end up flowing or staying in the top couple inches there. So kind of a cool demonstration to show you how our soils actually work. All right. By the way, too, a lot of our nutrients are actually interacting as well. So you'll notice um, part of the pro problem that we have with nitrogen, with potassium, these types of products, is if you don't get enough potassium, for example, in the soil, you're not going to get enough nitrogen into the plant either. You can see here, this is looking at soil tests, and you'll see that when we have a higher potassium level, you can actually get more nitrogen in the plant as well. We also see the same thing with nitrogen and sulfur. This is actually from tissue sample data from uh, within Winfield United throughout the entire United States. When sulfur was deficient, 91% of the time, nitrogen also came back deficient. So they're very, very closely tied together. Okay, whereas when sulfur was adequate, it was only about 30% of the time did our nitrogen actually come back deficient as well. Okay. So when we're talking about sulfur, um, the more sulfur that we can get available in season is going to be critical. It's a little bit different than nitrogen in the fact that it's taken up um, a little bit later in the season. In fact, only about 50% of our nitrogen is taken up by tassel in corn. So a little bit later applications of that sulfur, especially with its ability to move, that's what's going to be critical there. Okay, so kind of as a review here, diffusion, nutrients like potassium, phosphorus, uh, zinc, they're going to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. So the more nutrient that I can get in the soil, the quicker this interaction is going to take place. Mass flow moves with water. So the closer that I can get that nutrient to when the plant needs it. Now, I still need to have it in far enough advance to get a rain, get it into the soil. But for the most part, the closer that I can get it to that peak time of need, the better off I'm going to be. Then with root intercept, basically um, just the higher concentration of the soil, the more that I'm going to get there. So Derek, I'll turn it back to you. So oh, I, I mean, the, there's a lot of really good information here. And I think the, the thing that sticks out to me the most is just the recurring themes that we see over and over. And it doesn't matter if you're talking nutrition, if you're talking, you know, environmental monitoring, if you're talking just, uh, you know, your farming practices in general is just it's there's no one silver bullet. There is a there's a systems approach to everything. Right. And, you know, you can, you can compile you know, like a, a toolbox of different tools and, and practices in your, uh, in your operation to, to better understand the, you know, all of the different problems and, and what help you to predict what could become a problem in the future and just uh, reduce the overall risk. And I know that's kind of what Guy is going to talk about is kind of how, <clears throat> you know, we take this same exact concept of, you know, identifying what are, what are my potential risk factors? What are my uh, potential uh, issues that could come up throughout the season? And how do I catch those, uh, catch those early? Well, so, things, things you got to consider too, you know, we talked a lot about mass flow, um, monitoring that in season is tough. And so having information with weather stations, those type of things to help us know nitrogen, for example, if it's in the nitrate form for every inch of rainwater, it, it will move about six to 12 inches down in the soil profile. So the more rain that I get, the more risk that I have, and actually the more nitrogen I need, may need to apply in season, and that can vary from season to season. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and you know, it's a conversation that I'm having more and more often with, with growers out in the field is even guys that are not on irrigated uh, uh, environments you know, are looking into soil moisture sensors uh, to, you know, a multi-level soil moisture sensor so they can see that water moving throughout the yep. soil profile. And, you know, uh, you know, we've got this, uh, this new tool, a, a mobile laboratory that, that can allow guys to differentiate between ammonium and nitrate nitrogen in their soil tests right there from, from your home or office. 
Uh, so you can see how critical the timing is on these applications. You can see how crucial they can be to the end yield. And, you know, if you have a bad, you know, and I'm going to use my specific area, if you have a bad June, July, then, you know, there's not a lot you can do to fix it once you've hit that point. So constant testing, constant monitoring, all of this stuff is extremely important. Um, Tyler is going to be around uh, throughout the duration of this. I, I'll remind everybody, if you have questions, go ahead and hit that Q&A button, uh, throw it in there. We'll, uh, we can answer it, you know, either typed out or, or, or respond towards the end. But um, I'm going to go ahead. Again, thank you so much, Tyler. That was a, a great presentation, great demonstrations. I really appreciate it. Um, Guy, are, if you're ready, I think we'll just kind of transition right into, right into some of the stuff that, uh, that you've got to talk about. Awesome. I'm ready. You see my screen? Uh, yes. Um, I'll go through quickly and you can ask questions as we go along. How's that sound there? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much, Tyler. I mean, a lot of what we are and I'm going to talk about is the environmental side. How do we monitor these things? Uh, and this is a focus on uh, seeding and planting operations. But as Tyler described, it's really about a whole holistic set of tools that you need to look at for your farm. It's not one thing that's gonna actually solve the problem. You need a whole bunch of different IOT, Internet of Things devices to be able to solve the issues that you deal with, whether it's diseases, whether it's soil nutrients, what's my temperatures for seeding, soil moisture for seeding, you know, do I have frost alerts? You know, what's the conditions for spraying? So to do that, you've got to use a, a variety of different IoT devices as this diagram is showing in front of you. And we call that a nested approach. So, you know, we're all used to the weather station that monitors weather, but we also may need soil moisture probes as discussed here that monitor soil moisture, salinity, and soil temperature to see where we're at in the spring and throughout the year. As discussed, every inch of water equates to so many bushels of yield. Water is the catalyst to get the obviously nutrients to the crop, uh, we need to know that. If I've got eight inches of stored water, that's a whole lot different than four inches of stored water for yield potential. So we need to know that. In terms of nutrition management, we have, as Derek was talking about, a mobile lab to do both ammonia and nitrogen nitrate tests in season, in field, in multiple locations, and have results back to you within two hours. So that's another you know, plus of having a whole set of holistic tools and a nested approach. And there's lots of other things we could talk about, you know, crop disease models, for example. They're also available, assets for tracking, uh, tank storage, animal welfare. These are all things that are in place uh, as part of IoT. So when you talk about the impacts for seeding and germination, there's lots of words here, you know, really breaking it down based on the environment. You know, soil temperature is a critical thing. It drives all the metabolic processes. So we need to know that. Where are we at? You know, and for corn, we all like to use, you know, sorry for the metric here. This is 10 Celsius or about 50 Fahrenheit. I can convert fairly quickly because I'm used to it. Um, you know, we need, to know, we need to know that, you know, where we're at. It affects everything. Moisture as described, we need to have adequate moisture uh, in the soil uh, in terms of stored moisture, or we get that either from uh, what's there from snow melt or uh, rain early in the spring uh, to help with the rapid germination. The fertility rates obviously discussed here is critical. We need to have the amount of water available for germination is also affected as discussed by the type amount and placement of fertilizers in the soil. So that's another thing to be concerned about. Uh, fertilizers end up using some of that moisture up uh, that uh, is available for the seed uh, because it dissolves the fertilizer and brings it into solution. Another big thing is depth of placement. You know, when we talk about depth, there's a whole bunch of factors there, soil moisture, soil temperature, type of soil, trash cover, whole bunch of things. So really it's given in the time of year you're at, if you've got soil temperatures and moisture that are uh, cold and wet uh, soils, well, you wanna make sure your seed kind of shallow. If you have uh, drier conditions and warm conditions, you may see it a little bit deeper to tap other moisture deeper down. So there's a whole bunch of factors here with depth of placement as well. And then spring spraying, you wanna be able to spray and uh, take out those weeds so they're not competing uh, for moisture, nutrients and sunlight. So all those factors uh, are part of the whole seeding game as we know. And with stations today, you can look at a lot of these factors by using IoT solutions in your field. So we can actually look at, you know, 
are the fields wet for access? You know, what are my growing degree days? We've seen the importance of growing degree days and and nutrient use in a corn crop. You know, are there frosts in my fields? You know, what are my soil temperatures for seeding? All those things are tracked and you can be sent alerts of it either on an SMS or through a web server based on the systems we have in place. And the whole point of this is it's a value proposition for efficient management. We wanna become more efficient at what we do through the year. If you talk about a soil probe, you get very specific now. Now you have an in-field and even within a zone ability to look at soil temperatures, uh, soil moisture, and even soil salinity. So I can look at the, the soil temperatures for seed depth. I can look at the moisture levels at various sensors. I can look at my root zone, which is obviously the most important part, the rooting zone moisture, optimal timing of my uh, seeding and germination based on temperatures, and effectively control the depth based on ideal temperatures and moisture. So that's what these things graphs tend to show you here. We have the ability to look at an individual probe, the actual wilting point and field capacity and where I'm at every four inches within a soil profile down to depth, dependent upon the length of the probe. And these probes can be three feet, four feet in length. Or I can look at it as a summation of what my rooting zone moisture is and whether I'm in the right zone of moisture uh, for proper yield development. So again, it's about effective management. So when we look at this as, a, as an example of uh, seeding time, so we're looking here, you know, for soils 10 centimeters or four inches in depth. We can see soils begin to warm up. They're fairly cool. Then we get temperatures approaching, you know, nine degrees Celsius, about, you know, 48, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. We're getting in the window in that top 10 centimeter layer where we probably should be thinking about seeding. And then we see it flat and then warm out. So the window really begins around May 5th here and extends out for seeding. A little bit earlier, you're getting a little bit cooler, uh, not a lot of warming in terms of the soil. So very clearly you can see the diurnal range of soil temperature in the top layer, and then th that's four inches, eight, 12, and so forth. So this particular probe has a uh, depth down to 90 centimeter or three feet with a four inch increment of soil moisture, soil salinity, as well as uh, soil temperature. The top graph is showing you the top zone of moisture, what's available for the actual germination of the seed. So I can see rainfall events that have occurred here or irrigation and that those top layers, top 12, 16 inches are fairly good in terms of moisture. So again, because I have an IoT device in my field providing me real-time data, I see those conditions and I could you know, put a probe in each zone if I wanted to, if I have different zones within my field. So there's a lot of other options for in-field actionable tools within our systems. We have very precision forecast of the field. We have field preparation tools. We're talking about seeding and emergence, fertilization, work planning, and disease model. All these things have a significant impact on how we manage our operations. What they are built off of the work planning tools within uh, field climate is a very precision site-specific forecast. This forecast is developed for that actual device. It is corrected based on the device. So the data from the station actually nudges and tunes the forecast. We don't use one forecast model, we ensemble. So there's 15 or 20 forecast models blended. They're weighted based on performance each day, which makes for higher accuracy. What does that all mean? Now I have a very accurate forecast, not for the nearest town, but right for my field, where that device is installed. That provides precision hourly updates of things like temperature, precip events, probability of a, a rainfall, snow, uh, wind speed, wind direction, which leads into a whole bunch of things that you can do with a precision forecast. When to spray, are my fields accessible, planning, seeding operations, all those things. Again, that's a value proposition for less risk. How do we do that? with our partner Meteo Blue, we combine their meteorological forecasting with our station, correcting the forecast, and then show that as a detailed forecast hour by hour for the next three or seven days within uh, field climate. And you can also get that on your iOS and Android app as well. So you know, it's, it's, it's funny that, you know, you, you bring that up. That's, it's a, a bigger deal in most areas than, than we really give credit to. Cause a lot of times, especially as I travel throughout the Midwestern United States, you go into some small towns or more rural communities and 
And if they pull up their weather app, they're getting the forecast for a regional airport that's in some cases, you know, 40, 50 miles away. Yeah. So not only, I mean, it's, it, it makes it difficult to, to plan. It makes it difficult to understand how the, you know, the weather is affecting your specific location. And this, this, this function really alleviates all that and it gives you, you know, this is the forecast for the exact GPS coordinates of your field. Yeah, I mean, we all know that, you know, forecasting changes quite substantially over a short distance, precip especially, right? Temperature is not as much. So, you know, if you're going to run a disease model or a nutrient model based off of uh, data that's, you know, 30 miles away or 20 miles away, you know, it's not going to work. You've got to have data right for your field and a forecast for that field to be able to do that. So today in the world of meteorology, things are changing because of cloud computing, the capability to be able to run very complex forecast models down to a given point and update them hourly is possible. And that's what you're getting here within field climate is the combination of a very powerful forecast engine, the local data helping correct to give you a precision uh, tool set, as you see here of work planning tools that build into things like planting, fertilizer operations, you know, disease management, irrigation, and harvest timing. So we're just going to look at a couple of them. So in terms of the work planning tools inside of field climate, we have a whole bunch of them in there. Like I said, sowing windows, field accessibility, tillage ability, plant nutrition, plant protection, and harvest. Those are all driven off of that precision forecast. So things such as the soil temperature, humidity, rain, wind speed, growing degree days, soil moisture, weather forecast, all those things are combined in our work planning tools, which is really what is the current conditions in the field off the station combined with that weather forecast, then gets put into, as you see here, a tool that's color coded like a stoplight system, maroon through green, green being optimal, maroon being the worst, and updated hourly uh, for that condition. So this is field accessibility and it's saying, look, the field accessibility because of a heavy rainfall event is poor at that location and plus the conditions that have occurred to date and it gets better going out into the future because of drier conditions and warmer conditions. So that's an example of a work planning tool for field accessibility and again this is updated based on that forecast hourly for that pinpoint location. So you can do that uh, for a whole set of things. So how do we do that? In summary you take your device that's installed in the field which provides the real-time conditions you combine that with that precision forecast that's nudged in tune based on that station and you get put into a series of work planning tools as listed here. So this is looking at general sowing uh, conditions based off of that station and that forecast. And we do that in terms of corn. If we look at it, we actually break it out even further. Under sowing, we can see general potato, sugar beet and corn. So there's a specific here uh, work planning tool for sowing for corn. And when we look at corn, of course, we want rapid uh, germination and emergence. You know, a lot of people rush the seeding based on non optimal times, you know, get the seed in the ground as early as possible mentality, which is not the case we should be doing here. We should be looking at the conditions, to, you know, to get that crop out of the ground uh, and favorably growing. So we want to look at, you know, optimum seed bed temperatures as well as good moisture. And all that goes into this. So soil temperature, soil moisture in that 10 to centimeter, 10 to 20 centimeter or four to eight inch depth, air temperature and evapotranspiration. And that's what you get here then is this color coded system. In this case, three of them, maroon through green. And we can see that, you know, there are some conditions where they're moderately good, but then very poor. And we can see that overnight temperatures plummet down to around zero or 32. So there's not a lot of warming going on here. So it's not ideal for sowing uh, conditions. If these temperatures warm up a little bit, we would move into that, that green or optimum type seeding. So that's an example of a uh, sewing window based off of your precision forecast and your device that's installed in your field right for a specific crop, in this case of corn uh, available. So if we look at it in terms of field accessibility and tillage ability, again, these, these work planning tools are based on what's occurred at that field and the current conditions and the forecast. So field accessibility, we look at the amount of rainfall heavily. If we have a rain event of 30 millimeters, we expect you know, field access 
for most soils, limited access for most soils. If we have less than 30, 30 millimeters would be about an inch and a quarter, 20 millimeters would be about three quarters of an inch of rain, roughly. Uh, then we have more uh, ability to get into that field. So when we rank, rate that as a negative five to plus three. So we can see a fairly significant rainfall event, which brought down conditions, you know, they weren't perfect uh, for getting in for field accessibility. And then as it dried out and warmed up, that went up in terms of accessibility for that field. And if this forecast change going out, accordingly that, that uh, ranking would change for field accessibility based on the change in the forecast. So it's the same for uh, tillage. Tillage, we look at if we have more than 40 millimeters of rain, so that's approaching about an inch and a half, a little over an inch and a half of rain through a chosen period of time, then uh, you know obviously it makes it very difficult uh, for uh, tillage activity. And we rank that as negative five to plus two. So we're looking for, in this case, moderately dry to moderately wet soils being ideal for tillage operations. And why is that possible? Again, because you have your device, you have your precision forecast for that given field, uh, providing an update hourly of those conditions. So the work planning tool, the other thing you can do is really use a uh, plant protection or spray window. So we have that ability as well. And if you want to get into early season spraying, we have the ability to look at the optimal times for spraying. And this is really about the survivability of that droplet. Uh, and that droplet is measured through something called delta T. And delta T being an expression of temperature and humidity. So very dry and warm conditions will lead to a high delta T number above 10. And if it's wet and cool, you'll get a delta T number of less than two. So what does that mean? Well, whether the, whether the droplet will stick on the leaf or the weed or roll off, or it will evaporate and not uh, you know, stick to the leaf at all and crystallize and cause spray drift issues. So you know, we wanna be able to spray based under the best conditions. You can of course change um, spraying uh, operations by the type of nozzles and so forth and all that taken into account. You can push the Delta T uh, number a little bit different. So what we have here is a plant protection window, again, color coded showing when conditions are optimal hour by hour for spraying based off of things such as the temperature, humidity, delta T, the wind speed and direction and precipitation. So all that goes into this calculation for plant protection through time and you can see how it responds to periods of moisture and temperature uh, in terms of the operation. So you really know before you go to the field, you know, what are my conditions, what saves time and money You've verified the field weather conditions that are occurring there. You have a verified forecast for your field and a verified site specific real time and forecast the Delta T. So we provide the Delta T value on the station up to date. And we also provide the Delta T in the forecast going forward as well. So you've got then a record of your past spraying conditions as well for that given location. We also, you know, talked, I threw these slides in just now because we talked a little bit about, you know, obviously soil nutrition. We do have the ability within our system to uh, look at the biomass in fields through uh, satellite imagery, which allows you then to actually go in and use our mobile lab. So this is our mobile lab where you could go in and say, why is my biomass less here? Do I have an issue in terms of nutrition in the field? Uh, are my chemicals right? Are my balance right, as we talked about? Uh, why is it higher on these parts of the field versus this? So you could actually take samples of these different areas and within two hours of taking your sample, you would have your results back to you to know what you have in terms of your chemicals in the soil as well as plant sap. So if you actually wanted to take some samples of the leaves and do a plant sap analysis, this mobile lab device will provide you those answers rapidly so you no longer have to wait for your test to go out and come back to you. So we like to combine that as we talked about at the beginning with a whole bunch of holistic tools. So if I look at zones within a field, why are those zones there? Is it because that I have a difference in soil moisture? So it lets me see that maybe perhaps I need to install probes in these two different zones so that I have an understanding of soil moisture, which is driving my nutrient process in that field, of course and I can actually sample then what my nutrients are in those different locations with my mobile lab. So it's really about 
a holistic solution set of tools that you use in your field. Not one, but a whole series of them over the year that provides, you know, the improved return on investment for your crop. So we can look at the current and forecasted conditions for seeding, which we're talking about, and yield monitoring uh, tools for the soil, looking at soil nutrition and improve our bushels per acre, or we could reduce yield loss due to agronomic issues for diseases, as well as pests. So it's not one thing through the whole year that we're using to solve our problem, but a whole set of tools that help us improve our ROI because we are spending you know, an awful lot of money uh, per acre, and this is relative to whatever crop you're doing. So I just wanna conclude by saying those infield sensors and actual tools provide a holistic set of uh, decision support tools, both hardware and software, uh, to you for particular agronomic problems. In this case, we're talking about seeding emergence, but also in terms of crop nutrition, diseases, and insects throughout the year. So, you know, what we're talking about here is the merging of digital agronomy, which is traditional agronomy and IoT technology uh, together. Uh, you really know before you go, you save a lot of time and money. You have a whole set of holistic solutions through connected fields for seeding conditions. And we have actionable tools like I've showed you here, work planning tools, you know, based on a stoplight system approach that can be used. The key is boots on the ground. You know, we provide the, the, the set of tools here, but you still obviously need boots on the ground is the key. When do I make those decisions based on my agronomist? And we provide continually learning of this through our e-learning platform uh, on these new technologies as well. So I'll leave it at that. I've done a lot of talking and perhaps there's some questions. Yeah. Um, you know, one last thing, you know, Guy had mentioned actionable tools and another thing, you know, that we didn't, didn't touch on a whole uh, lot is that, you know, you can set alerts on these stations as well to alert you, you know, so yeah. for specific conditions. So you don't necessarily have to, to wait until you're checking on it or, or remember to check it. If you have a certain set of conditions that let's say take spraying for instance, and, and you want the station to, to be more proactive, it will send you a message when you're outside of, uh, the accessible or when you're outside of the uh, the acceptable conditions. So uh, I will remind you uh, if it's either any question for, for either of our guests today, feel free to go ahead and type it in that question and answer. We do have one um, guy that I'll, I'll okay. throw to you. Uh, you and that's jump in here and, and make one comment on your last statement there. I know that some of you guys that are in the Midwest are dealing with uh, soybeans, um, that are dicamba tolerant, but there's a lot of restrictions around wind speed and wind direction. This would help dramatically on those. Yeah. Oh yeah. Re I real mean, time Delta T. Yeah. That's, I mean, and that, those are the questions that, you know, we're getting as specifically in, you know, in your, in my area um, is managing that, <laughs> that chemical specifically. So um, one question guy, and I'll throw this to you. How do we use soil sensors for a crop like tea where land is not parallel? In, in a land that's not, okay. So you obviously you got to break up your, you're talking about very uh, hilly topography, uh, I think is the question. And how do you monitor that uh, soil yeah. moisture sensors? Well, you would obviously have to have um, probes uh, installed in the low areas, you know, mid slope and up slope because they're completely different conditions for growth. And it's, you know, no different to actually on fields that we have. If we have, you know, a hill, those conditions for uh, yield potential are a lot different than uh, the mid slope and the lower slope. So you actually have to have a, a number of probes in the, in the ground to be able to see those differences. And then accordingly, if you're irrigating that, if you're not, um, you know, you're applying your water based on what's required on the higher slopes than in the lower slopes. So it's just more, more sensors are required within the field to, you know, provide you the proper data to be able to produce an actionable item out of it. Okay. Well, is there, is there any other questions that we have out there? I want to thank everybody for, for joining us today. Thank you. Um, thank you, Guy. Thank you, Tyler. Oh, oh we got one. So, in the U.S., how many sensors are recommended to cover uh, an area? So, like, if you had a, let's say you have a quarter or, or 160 acre square field, how many sensors would you recommend, guy, throwing in? I there? guess it, 
I, I leave that to uh, the boots on the ground deciding on the zonations that you have within that field. You know, say you have two or three zones in that field, you may want to have two or three sensors over that field uh, to understand it. You know, a very dry, you know, sandy soil versus a clay loam soil is going to behave completely different uh, in terms of the amount of water there. How you about know, with how about with a station like in weather forecasting? Oh, one one weather station, um, you know, it's going to provide you a pretty good forecast for a fairly good area around it. Uh, dependent upon the type of device that you have in that field, we can set a forecast up for one station in that field, you know, or have one weather station that's serving, you know, an area around it of three, five miles as an example is probably good. So we can build a site specific forecast for each field if you want, or have a weather station that's providing you, you know, these tools for an area of five miles around it, for example, either or. Excellent. Well, if there's, uh, if there's nobody else again, thank you, Guy. Thank you, Tyler. We will have this, uh, we're recording this, uh, this webinar. So we'll, we'll make that available. Um, please make sure you're, you're following, you know, Meadows Canada, Meadows USA, Pestle Instruments and Winfield United on, on, you know, social media. I know Winfield does a really good job of, uh, you know, on Twitter and Instagram of uh, updating with new and unique solutions and, and research that they're doing as does you know, uh, us at, at Meadows, both USA, Canada, and, and all over the world are really building a, a, a presence of, of showing a lot more information there as well. So to stay up to date on the, the newest things, on promotions, on when we're doing these webinars uh, in the future, uh, make sure to look us up on social media and follow us. Uh, thank you all for being here. And with that, I think I'll kind of wrap things up. So thank you. Thank you.